Hello and welcome to another episode of Architecture for Kids podcast. I'm your host, Antonio Caplão. I'm a trained architect, an architectural educator and founding director of award-winning Architecture for Kids CIC. In this podcast, I'm going to talk to practitioners and creatives that share the same passion as I do, to inspire and to engage children and young people to shape their built environment and the creative industries. The podcast is brought to you in collaboration with the Built Environment Trust, the Thornton Education Trust and the Wells School of Architecture, Cardiff University. My guest today is Matt Bell, Strategic Communications Director at Edowick Studio, a global design practice of 250 problem solvers dedicated to making the physical world around us Better for everyone. Matt has previously held leadership roles with international NGOs, public bodies, and the FTSE 100 business in the property, design, and development sectors. He sits on the board of Local Trust, a 15 year lottery funded program pioneering new ways of building community across the UK. He is also chair and co founder of Woolwich Contemporary Print Fair an accessible platform in the cutting edge of art curation and co-creator of a pioneering visual arts project called the Young London Print Prize. For 10 years, he was the chair of Open Homes for Children, an international charity that works to stop the institutionalization of children. He also jointly devised the award-winning Street Elite program which uses sport and mentoring to tackle unemployment and alienation among young adults. Matt, thank you for coming to talk to me today, and I'm very much looking forward to our conversation. Hi, great to be there. What were you good at school in terms of subjects, and uh, what was your favourite? Well, I, so my, what I did good at school, I did history. I loved history because I loved writing, um, and I suppose I was um, a bit more introverted back then, and um so I quite like, I love the humanities, I put like a bit more um, of a safe space for me, I suppose. Um, and then over life has gone on after university, I trained as a youth worker and that kind of propelled me into this space. But the back then it was all medieval history, which I loved. Did it get kind of informed or helped where you are today with your career and your work? Oh, the book that sort of changed my life was The Name of the Rowies by Umberto Oko, um, which is a fan- fantastic book. But, um, and it talks a lot about, so it's based in the Benedictine monastery down in France, and this kind of murder mystery. There's a terrible film which completely kills the book. But read the book, don't watch the film. But it, um, it speaks about kind of um, faith and hope, which kind of guys my values quite a lot. Um, and I think if you're working with young people, then you need those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. But it's also set in this, it paints this incredible picture of this monastery on a mountain. So the kind of architectural backdrop to the murder mystery was phenomenal. But they kind of made me look and think. I think a lot of people don't even look at buildings. You know, they're this incredible backdrop to our lives and we don't even begin to look or ask how they make us feel or to think that we could change it. And that's partly what I'm passionate about now. I think people doesn't look in general. That's true, but buildings above all, that sense we just assume they're there and you can't do anything about it. And yet they are the platform for everything we do, especially yeah. as it is. Even the same path every day, if you really look, you find something different every day. There's always something new. There is often you need like a parent or a friend or somebody. So for most people who've done work, you need somebody to kind of give you that lunch. Maybe, so with my kids, I've constantly gone on and done, we'll look at the building, you know, do you like it, do you not like it? I don't care, just have an opinion. What sort of made you work with young people and children? I've always been quite self-conscious. I'm a bit of a fraud in the architecture world. But I, so when I left university, I went to, my early part of my career was in the NGO sector. So I trained as a youth worker. And then when I worked um, in Thailand doing the HIV pandemic for a bit, and in Bolivia on doing community development work, and I guess the, if you're doing community work, often there's a particular demographic or setting which I think speaks to you most. Mm-hmm. And mine was always working with young people and I guess particularly with young men because mm-hmm. um, they're nuts and brilliant and stupid and all of those things, which I kind of I tend to vibe with. You are a strategic communicators uh, director at the Other Week Studio. And what is uh, the studio doing in terms of youth engagement and what projects are you involved? So the, we're just about to launch a big creative education program. So stepping back on that, I think the, one of the issues we've got is we tend to focus on architecture and work with 16 to 18 year olds and desperately try and broaden the pipeline and make it more diverse and kind of get 
late teens, I suppose, into architecture and potentially into university and studying and, and working in the profession. I think that's too late. And what we're going to do is launch quite a big program, which is working particularly with 10 to 14 year olds. One of the things I think happens to most young people in Britain, actually, is about aged five. You're with like a teacher or a parent and they're a bit stressed and a bit busy and you're a five year old. So they need to keep you quiet. And they literally, they put a piece of paper and a pencil in front of you and they go, there you go, do you draw something. And of course, what happens is most of the drawing is rubbish because it's quite a hard thing to do. But what happens is that teacher or that pair of leans over and goes, fine, yeah, maybe, maybe science for you or football. And that message of you're not creative begins to percolate through. And it happens first when you're aged kind of five and then gets reinforced through the education system. It happens in your subject choices. And by the end of it, most of us, if you go into a room and say, look, who's creative here? Most people don't put their hand up. And that's being told to them ever since they were five and you end up as a pupil living in a country where we're all supposed to do maths till we're 18. So there's, which is a madness. So we've got a challenge out. I think we need to start early and speaking to young people before they made their subject choices, before you pick your GCSEs to say, everybody's creative. I mean, whatever you want to be amazing at, you want to be an incredible scientist, an incredible sports person, they are creative. They have two things in common. They work like a dog and they're incredibly creative. That's how you get to be successful. So that messaging about creativity is really, really key. And at Heather Whip, what we're trying to do is we've got a new studio out of which we're working. I mean, just like the King's Cross, it's got an amazing groundfold space, which we're going to put all the objects and the models and open up to the public and bring hundreds of young people in there at that early stage each to go, look, creativity is a magical thing and you're creative and you might draw, you might make, you might do product design, you might do all sorts of stuff, but you are creative. Defy creativity. Creativity. I'm, I'm going to give a hopeless definition, but it's, it's, the, it's the expression of what you feel through your hands. Um, it's one way of looking at it. Which, so it's not just, it's so that prism of creativity is drawing. So drawing is hugely important, but it, it's only one way that you express with creativity. But it's, it's, yes, it's the physical expression of, of, that, um, of your imagination through your body. Putting together something with your hands, for instance, of so completely. But that's what I love about the work of the designers at Heatherwood, for instance. It always starts with making in materials. You know, it never starts with drawing. Um, it's always about what's the problem that we're trying to solve, and then looking at how you make or combine materials to come up with an idea, which might then be part of the solution. So it's it's hardwired into Heatherwood, I think. Partly because Solis was an architect, you know, he's come from a kind of furniture and product design background, essentially. And there's this incredible breadth of people in the studio. So there's some great architects. There's landscape designers, product designers, all sorts of people. Men literally make them in many different ways. Can I jump back in a little bit yeah, about the education? Probably we've got in the design sector generally is when we're trying to support young people, we tend to do incredible projects for 16 to 18 year olds. And there's about four of them involved. See those? So they tend to be like this beautiful golden experience for tiny numbers of young people when they've already made their choice. And why do you think that is? Because it's become habit, because there's not a lot of expertise, because we're slightly stuck in a, oh, well, you, you do this stuff around that kind of A-level, a 16 to 18 space, and then you kind of look at what others are doing and do the same thing. It's kind of natural. But I think we need to challenge that and kind of interview much earlier. So there are some studios doing that. Grimshaw's just beginning to do some fabulous work, which I'm a huge fan of. But it needs to be earlier. It needs to be high volume. You know, like if we're doing, if the London architecture scene, and this is only in London, but is speaking to or engaging with a thousand young people out of 100, 200, 300,000, you're never really going to change the way people see the physical environment or engage. So we need to go earlier. We need a light touch. It needs to be inspirational. It needs to be, it needs to be, Big numbers. There is a volume going there. What needs to change? Well, the schools are desperate for it because they're absolutely on their knees. There's a there's a really famous TED talk um, with a guy called Ken, who a lot of people have seen talking about creativity in schools. Um, he talks about the universe of bias that every education system in the world has. So if you look at all of them, whether it's China, the States, the UK, wherever you go, it's science at the top, data humanities, then the art. Mm. And it's replicated everywhere. And absolutely, it's lost in this country. So the, the state education system has ripped out any funding for any kind of arts education at all. 
I do a lot of work in schools. You go in there, they haven't even got paper, honestly, let alone inks, let alone rollers or anything. These are nine pounds a year that they give for art school. It's brutal. It's insane. So you stand back and look at your site and think, is that a mistake? Is that deliberate? Is that a conscious choice or just accident? And I, I tend to think a lot of these things are cock up rather than conspiracy. I just think it's fallen away. So you get the young people part. If you're speaking to the teachers and engaging with schools, that's always really hard because schools are like a castle, aren't they? They're their own secret world. But when you got in through the door and you've made that connection with the year six teacher or whoever it is, with a really good creativity, built environment, design, whatever it might be offered, there's huge interest. So um, the appetite's there, the need is immense. I think as a sector, we've got to reach out much more. Our line to your programs are with a mm-hmm. curriculum. Each situation has its own challenges. With the with the year one, of course, you've got to pitch to the right son. But say in year seven and eight, um, those first two years of secondary, there's much more fluidity in the curriculum. So you're going to, it's much easier to get teachers to engage with years seven and eight than it is with, say, year 10, you know, and years 12, but not years 13. So you've just got to tailor it a bit. I do think the giving them out of the classroom has become more difficult. A lot of schools I've seen over the last year, what they've done in order to cope with the energy bills, they've, they've sat, essentially, they've cut the posts where you had teaching assistants. So um, you've had got a head, they've got a budget, the energy costs going through the roof. You've obviously got to look at revenue funding that. So the people who they might have had as TAs who could have taken or accompanied those young people on their visit to your studio or the V&A or God knows where, that's been a real problem. Um, so yeah, it's not easy. But and for most young people, there's a moment, and this is the great thing about doing youth work of any sort, there's a moment where somebody really listens to them and appreciates and endorses, and there's a kind of moment in your head where you think, well, maybe I am quite creative. That's what I liked about what you're doing and this new project that you're starting, because it gives that option much earlier on in life. How does the program work, and how do you design this program? The other problem I think we have doing built environment or architectural education as an early stage is everything tends to be bespoke. You know, so you get these amazing projects, which are uniquely designed, work incredibly with five people, and then they go and do something completely different than another project next year. So at the moment, we're co-designing with a group of young people the module that we're going to use. So we get them, because it's telling guys, what's fun, what's interesting, what do you want to do? And then we'll have one module only. And there's going to be a two-hour version and a four-hour version. That's it. And then there's a team of 15 Heatherwick inspirers who are basically designers within the studio who we trained up to be able to run that module, and then we can offer that out through two organizations, external organizations, who work with young people all the time. So we don't have that interface with young people, so we need partners who can who do it all the time, but a lot of them are doing programs which don't have a creative element to it. So for them, it, it enhances their offer to their young people. For us, it brings young people to the studio. So essentially, it's one core module, which we can vary a tiny bit, but we'll just run that constantly for the next few years. It's getting really, really good at it. Be efficient, roll it out, get the numbers, and it's about inspiration, not the curriculum. So it's about coming in, looking at some incredible models of our space, and, and then making stuff, because after they've looked, they, you don't want to get in hands dirty and make stuff. And then the questions are all about, how did you get to do this? Do you really do decent money? What was the challenges? You know, it's all the career and job questions, because young people are quite transactional. That's quite cool. How much? There always needs to be super specific. And when is this starting? It's launching in September. How many uh, students are you got? People that you've been to have? With 600 young people over three years and see how it goes. Um, so it's quite a big new step for the studio. And is it kind of London based or is a particular area in London that you have been to focus? The whole London question is problematic, isn't it? The other things that's happened over the last 10 years, that network of architecture centers that 10, 15 years ago used to exist across the UK. I mean, that funding's been decimated. Some of them are still like, doing amazing kind of fighting the good fight but i hope over the next couple of years we'll find a way nationally to get public funding back into the architecture center network there's places like the parallel stuff up in newcastle which are great you know so there are outposts but um that london comparatively speaking has quite a lot of it the real need is in your doncasters your great yarn yes your portsmouth how are you going to fund this uh, project we'll we'll fund it out of our own so it's the studio putting his hand in his pocket and going, the stuff matters. Because this is an investment in our economy and our future. Creative industries kind of bring so much money to our economy. Could perhaps talk a little bit about your uh, Woolwich Contemporary Spring Fair. You are a co-founder. 
but you have set up the Young London Print Prize. Yeah, this is my um, sort of side hustle, passion project, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, um, yeah so I, we had a fair, an artist and a curator. Um, we launched a um, Bullish Contemporary Print Fair back in 2015. It was partly out of the anger that there isn't really a platform, I suppose, for printmaking, which is one of the kind of fine art disciplines that I love most. And printmaking is interesting because it's always been the most revolutionary um, of art forms. If you look at literally how revolution has started in the European context, certainly over the last 500 years, always been based on printmaking. You look at the Protestant Reformation, you look at 1789 in France, like print was the way that people exchanged ideas and information and began to see the world differently. So we set this up partly to kind of give contemporary print a new platform. So um, it's grown like Topsy. We uh, run a big fair down in Woolwich at Woolwich Works. Um, on the roll last still for four days um, from October. It's not legal last week, last Thursday to Sunday of October. And uh, there's a mixture of emerging artists there. And we have one kind of rule, which is nobody did. We've just finished the court entries. We had about 1,300 artists applying from all over the world. So it's really burgeoning. It's an international art fair. And out of that has come um, a youth education program called the Yarn Prip Pride. And that's um, completely judged and created and curated by young people. So no detail. So there's no adult decision-making anywhere. So we work with um, 10 and 11-year-olds to create prints. They're all themed around the idea of climate art. So it's kind of connecting culture and art with the climate crisis and youth voice. They make their prints. Then alongside that, we work with a group of 17-year-olds from across London, and they learn about careers and contemporary art, and then they judge them all. Essentially, I kind of lock them in a room at the end of the process, give them 2,000 submissions, and they have to pick a top three. So it's a serious big day, um, and they absolutely made those choices. And then we showcase the winners. I managed to get the Piccadilly Lights to give me 10 minutes each year on the whole Piccadilly Lights. So we put the top three winners up there and then showcased them right next to, like alongside those big famous printmakers and artists at Woolwich, man, and the, the following week. What do you think about in terms of the balance between, in this case, could be the artist or the curator and, and the young people or the building environment, the designer as the expert, as the person with the knowledge and the young people, the user. How do you, see, how do you put all this together? Well, it takes us into a conversation about community engagement and young people's involvement in how cities change and building projects, which I'm also, I think is also really important. The key conversation we don't have is about power. Now, with like any engagement program, there's there's lots of literature on it. You've got the ladder, you should move up your ladder of engagement and get to the top. But basically, it boils down to a choice between information, engagement, and what people are now calling co-production or impact. The initial bit is, is a human bite. So I'm not asking you as a developer to share that information. You have an obligation to do it. So the information is consultation, and that's mandatory. Well, at least it's not legal, but it's mandatory. That's the basics. A lot of people now, unlike maybe 10 or 15 years, step into the engagement space. The problem for young people is moving from engagement to actually sharing and conceding power. And I guess they, those things aren't specific to young people's views. So if I'm an adult, a 17-year-old, a 70-year-old, something's changing in my neighborhood on my street. I want to know about it. So the information is a kind of just share it. The engagement is tricky because everybody's busy and young people are busy too. So like you're going to engage me, but unless I get on to and being empowered, unless there's a conversation about power, I never really, I don't know quite why I get engaged. So that's the incentive, you know. That's the incentive. So the, the challenge for us is to take a conversation from engagement to that third stage where you're actually conceding power to make some decisions about what's going to change. So within any engagement process, there's that stage where you should be producing scope of influence. You know, what can change it? As a developer, you might be saying, look, um, the affordable housing quotient, that's not up for grabs. You know, that is what it is. And you might, well, it's women called, but actually we're not going to give you one. But what we can talk about is the public realm. We can talk about um, that the way this place is going to be managed or maintained. There's all sorts of areas where we can literally concede power to young people and actually, that's the point about which they get engaged because they they see very clearly what's being offered. You want me involved because you want to tick a box. You want some nice picks. Good. Okay, so there's people of color involved. Better make your picks nicer. 
super lovely. Yeah. I see you on that. And they see it a mile away. The point where they'll properly engage was when you're going, and you can make some decisions here. And I I also actually loathe the word empowerment because empowerment is still me as the good and gracious. So a language about conceding power and then being really specific about where that lies is completely crucial. And I, so to give a, a practical example, I've been working on a program, for instance, recently where they're setting up a community development trust and the people in charge of it, there's a government structure, obviously, and they're putting in place um, rules that it's not chorus without anybody under 25 around the table. So literally, they can't make significant decisions without a young person or a young adult around the table. God, that's fantastic. As if you're a young person, you kind of go, okay, that i beginning to think you might be serious. There's actually a, some kind of resharing of power going on in the discussions about how that place is going to be managed. So yeah, no, we've got to talk about power much more. So what needs to change? So there's maybe two things. There's the, uh, the emphasis on creativity and engaging much more broadly with many more hundreds of thousands of young people to, to change the messaging about being creative. And it's, it's, and it's totally central importance to you being successful in life, whatever you choose, you know, architecture or not. So that creativity piece at a young age to a high volume, that's really key. And then in terms of the community, when you might the kind of community engagement conversation around design projects, you know, in the physical environment, there are, um, there's a load of things which need to change there. I think it's got a lot better. I think there's much more of it. So I think we're, I, I think there's an appetite to get involved. Most of all is primed. And why is that? Online. Because they're, like, they're a surveyor. Yeah. You know, if that. And then you're saying, can you speak to a bunch of 16 year right? Most developers are not the bad guys. They just don't know how to do it. There's also a question for us as a design world about being much better at it. So I think one of the selfish values by Hathaway, for instance, and in doing a big project here, is that us working with young people will increase our own skills as designers to do great public engagement. You know, so there's a, it's a two-way street there, which is great. There's like a selfish motive, which helps in all sorts of ways so you're not just working with young people because it's philanthropic, doing it because it will make you a better designer and deliver better projects and happier clients and everything that goes with that. So there's a kind of an engagement with developers. There's a stepping up on ourselves. And there's a, there's a willingness to, to kind of challenge as well, which I, I don't often see many design practices or development teams really saying this matters fundamentally. You know, like, who the hell are you building for? It's for their next generation. If you don't have them around the table, you'll design less interesting stuff. Be more prosaic, but actually, you also won't maintain and help that place to thrive because those future residents or inhabitants, they haven't been part of the conversation. So all that bit about it, so we talk the language of kind of curating places and the long-term management. It's not just about placemaking. You know, we kind of moved on from the placemaking bit. It's actually about making and managing and helping this stuff be curated and thrive like a turn, that implies that you're going to get young people around the table and give them authority to be part of making that happen. When did this conversation, in your opinion, start becoming uh, more to the forefront of bringing uh, young people uh, to the discussion? And and how much has it changed? Well, we tend to be super pessimistic about the last 10 years. And there's been lots of bad stuff. Weirdly, the conversation about youth engagement in property and real estate and design has kind of flourished. Um, and I can't quite explain that. There have been some individuals who've done phenomenal work. Yeah. Thompson's amazing, Diana Born out, all sorts of people who've done some amazing work who are complete superheroes. You begin to see it reflected in policy a little bit. So the GLA is saying the right words, which is great. So, um, why these things bubble up, I'm not sure. I think there's... So there's a brilliant youth engagement toolkit called Voice Opportunity Power, which kind of sets out a kind of, here's how to do it. Doesn't matter if you're not an expert, so check that out online. It's a fantastic way of just um, being able to apply the basics to any project or design process. And then there are some great examples popping up. But I'm super encouraged by when I can see people vacillating, I'm like, well, obviously, I'm not going to talk to you about the legal case or the moral case or any of the policy stuff, which should all drive you here. The issue is this political gold dust. You're working on a project. Tell me a local council which doesn't love the youth engagement or that it doesn't play well at any planning committee, whatever you're bringing forward. That, that ability to say, we've properly engaged young people. We've given them a voice here. 
and they will be a part making this happen. Uh, designing for the future, which is if you just design what you know, if you don't bring new influence, it's all about either the past or now and what you know. And it's so important to mix things up. You know? Absolutely. So you get lots of architects talking about future proofing. And I always go, how do you future proof without engaging young people? Hugely important, but that mindset needs to translate through and to make the stuff happen with young people. So very much kind of talking about how this has changed and there's so much more appetite. I think we're in a kind of make it happen moment with youth engagement of normalizing it. There's lots of good practice. The policy stuff is fine. We're not looking for those kind of drivers. It needs everybody to kind of go, okay, on this project, we will make it happen. Very practical. I think we are in a rupture moment of many things. And education, personally, I think it needs to change. What you need to learn is skills and how to be creative, our problem solving, which we, you know. And that's the creativity piece. That's the affirming young people that you are creative and that if you want to be successful at anything, Show me a person who's not successful and who's successful and not creative and getting them to just kind of make that connection in their heads. So the penny drops and they embrace creativity rather than look at the way the curriculum is structured and what seems to be valued. That point I was making about science, humanities, art. That's what we need to challenge. And support. I never knew I wanted to be an architect. And I wish I had been supported and kind of, you know, and it had been kind of sort of... uh inspired to do more things and draw more and look more at architects or designers. Just telling young people that it's a, that they're fantastic at it, that it's great. Now, the challenge and the affirmation can go together, but we, they tend to hear a lot more challenges and affirmations, the truth. Okay, look, everything around you, it's all made. Nobody yeah. made it. We could pull these materials together and make or remake, and it could be a different kind of desk. It could be a different kind of street. It, it, that is so important, what you just said. Kids. They don't realize yeah. we made everything. And putting that in the context of the discussion about AI as well, because creativity is the only thing that will say it. You might get a screwdriver and undo the robot. Otherwise, you've got to be creative. That's coming to us all. This is going to, what's going to make us stiff. That sounds a bit hyperbolic, but that's the kind of, that's the, that's the niche for humanity in, in the coming world. Is there a question I should have asked you that I haven't asked? And if so, what is that question? No, I'd love the discussion. Thank Thank you very much to my guests today, to all the listeners, and please subscribe to Architecture for Kids podcast and leave your rating and the review. Recommend us to your friends and family. And to find out more about it, visit our websites, antoniocaplan-portfolio.co.uk, buildingcenter.co.uk, thorntoneducationtrust.org, cardiff.ac.uk and follow us on Instagram arch for kids CIC Twitter and Kaplan LinkedIn and Kaplan C-A-P-E-L-A-O and please join me again next week for another episode of Architecture for Kids podcast brought to you in collaboration with the Built Environment Trust the Thornton Education Trust and the Welsh School of Architecture Cardiff University